Well, I don't have to ask you if you have enjoyed the presentation, because if you didn't, you wouldn't be here. And uh, we're thankful that you're here, and we're looking forward to the good material. Any one of us that have made our living making public presentations know that the hour after lunch is not the desired hour to speak. I, but I have firecrackers. <laughs> <laughs> so he has equipment up here to keep you awake. And uh, I want to tell you that I have queued in the people that are operating the cameras because it is being filmed and it is uh, going live stream. And I've instructed them to zero in on anybody in the audience that's sleeping. <laughs> I think we don't have to worry about that much. Bruce, once again, we are so thankful you're here. We're going to pause and ask God's blessing to be on your presentation. Amen. Gracious Father, thank you so much for the beauty that you have given us mm -hmm. through creation, for the instruction you have given us through the Word that points us to creation. And we pray that you would bless now Bruce once more and one of his many presentations to share the beauty of your plan for this world. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. So we have embarrassment and loud noises to keep you awake. <laughs> so this is actually one of my favorite lectures. It's the one I often do first when I go into a school. And it, I like it because it gets at what I know is in the back of almost every teenager if I'm talking to them. Like, I have 15 minutes, I, I, well, sometimes 45 minutes, in a school session to give them the evidence for creation. And whether you're in a Christian school or a non-Christian school, I kind of know what's going through these kids' heads. Yeah, I hear this guy talking about this evidence for creation and the Bible, but how can all the experts be wrong? How can all these college professors and all of these museums and all this stuff on the internet and all the national park signs, how can it all be wrong, especially like about the age of the earth and the idea of life developing long millions and billions of years ago? And, and you know, they're told that 95% or more of all biology professors believe evolution is an absolute fact of science. How can they all be wrong? And you tell them something and you know immediately all they're going to do is Google, well, here's what he said, what, what's everybody else saying? And they're going to get something completely contradictory. Um, so it's, it's like, how do I deal with that? Now, the uh, Rocks Cry Out sessions, the 18 lessons on this little video drive, the majority of them end with the last little five to 10 minute section that deals with that question. How can intelligent, smart, sincere people be so wrong about what they believe to be true? And I wanna start this session with that crystal clear, straightforward statement that God gave us at the beginning of the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Now, if you look at that statement, and I'll ask students, is that a statement of science and scientific evidence and scientific stuff, or is that a statement of religion? And the majority of them, if they're willing to be candid, will say, well, it involves God. It's mainly a religious kind of statement based on faith. And I'll ask them, okay, to know which one it is, don't you think you need to understand what is science? How does it operate? How can it figure things out? Uh, and I let them know what my background is as a scientist. And, and as we go along, we're going to look at examples from, bi from astronomy first and cosmology. Then we're going to look at examples from biology. Then we're going to look at examples from geology. And those are the three main huge like buckets of scientific disciplines, it's like paleontology, anthropology, geology. Those are all geological sciences. Medicine, uh, genetics, uh, microbiology. Those are all biological sciences, biology. And astronomy, cosmology, physics, those are the astronomical sciences. We'll look at examples from that of, well, how do we know? How can we actually know for sure? And God expects us and holds us accountable for knowing he exists. Based on observing creation, that it didn't make itself. That God's the one who made it. Well, oops, I stuck these in the wrong spot. Hang on a second. Let me jump some on down to here. Hmm. 
Hang on just a second. I added some slides, and it seems like things are in the wrong order. They are. I'm going to move all this to the very end. Okay. Just bear with me a moment. This is what comes from rearranging things at the last minute. I'm just sticking them down here. Okay. So what is science? Science studies how creation operates. And it's the study of time, energy, space, and matter, and how they interact. And honestly, that's all a scientist actually has to operate with. What can you touch, feel, see, hear? How do they interact with each other? How do, they, how do chemicals perform? Uh, when you add energy, what happens, and so on. Well, anybody see time in that first verse of the Bible? In the beginning. The beginning of what? The beginning of time. That statement deals with time. How about energy? You, you can't create anything without energy. Energy is inherent in something being created or happening. How about space? Literally, that ancient word, heavens, means everything above the earth, space itself. And the earth is literally something that is touchable, a matter. So everything a scientist has to deal with is mentioned in the very first verse of the Bible, and it tells us where did it come from. Now, if you don't choose to believe that, the only alternative is that everything made itself, okay? That's the only thing left. If some entity, and if you look at the universe with all its energy and power, an almost infinitely powerful and creative entity made it, the only other option is that it made itself. Now, here's what God tells us, and I referred to this this morning, Romans 1, 19 and 20, and it goes on from here. But that which may be known about God is obvious to everyone. That's the context of this verse, every human being. Whether you lived 4,000 years ago, whether you live today, whether you're an old man or a young child, whether you're a PhD college professor or a truck driver, whatever, whoever or wherever you've ever lived or been, by simply looking at what God has made, you're without excuse for belief in him. Because of the creation of the world, things are clearly seen. And even God's very power and nature, his Godhead, are known by looking at what he's made. So everybody's without excuse. No one will die someday and stand before God and say, well, if someone had just come and told me about Jesus, I, I would have obeyed and followed you. We have no excuse because we know he exists. Now, that's really, really clear. I, I like to call what God knows is important. He makes crystal clear in his word, and he repeats it over and over again, New and Old Testament, to emphasize it. And this comes up, that it is by creation we will know he exists. So let's look at some examples. Now, we'll start with the what I like to call the great mysteries of science. About 20 years ago, Time Magazine had a cover article called The Great Mysteries of Science. And they listed 20 things which science had never been able to figure out where they came from, why they were. One of them was the creation of life. One of them was where does male and female sexes come from? One of them is, is big gaps in the fossil record. And, and they were candid that these had never been solved by science. The reason they've never been solved is because science has been defined to leave God out. Now, I'm, I don't script my talks. I kind of go where God tells me, um, or, or I think he wants me to go. Let me put it that way. Um, and, and I kind of want to throw a few extra things in now and then, because I think it's important for everybody to know when they're talking to other people. Science wasn't always this way. We, we kind of live today, and we see the way that things are, and you kind of fall by default into this idea that, well, it's always been that way. The founders of modern science back in the 15, 16, 1700s, the, the uh, Louis Pasteur's and the Isaac Newton's and the James Maxwell's and, and, and the, uh, uh, the, the, um, all the other really basic major original scientists that discovered how does creation operate essentially all of them believed in a literal creation by a biblical God about 6,000 years ago. All of them. And it didn't keep any of them from developing modern science. And yet, 
it's portrayed that if we started to believe the Bible, we would be dragged back into the Dark Ages. It, it's an absolute lie. The opposite is true. There's all sorts of things like this 98% apes are identical to human DNA that, that turns out to, to have like delayed science. For, for 100 years, we were told there's all sorts of vestigial organs in our bodies, leftovers from our evolutionary past. As one animal evolved into another, things aren't needed anymore and they're just leftover pieces and parts like like our tailbone or our appendix or our tonsils every single one of them have been found to have really useful important functions uh, and in a fall into uh, creation occasionally some of them stop functioning well and they do have to be removed but that doesn't mean they didn't have a purpose and they still do so it's 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 been a detriment to science this whole evolution idea but let's look at the formation of the universe. Two examples. How can we know what is the truth? The first one is, where did everything come from? Um, and as I mentioned, if you think of the universe as this box, and it's a jewelry box, and uh, inside of it there's, there's all these finely crafted, beautiful, colorful, intricate, different kinds of jewelry. Think of those as the animals. If they weren't created, the only option left is that they made themselves. The stars, the time, the matter, the energy, and then stars spewed out more complex chemicals and elements, and then those came together to form life, um, and then bacteria, which would have been the first form of life, somehow slowly turned into multicellular organisms, and they grew eyeballs, and they grew arms and legs, and they crawled up onto the land, and all those things are useful. Well, if they suddenly had something that was useful, yeah, then they would make more and more of that kind of creature. And it kind of sounds a little logical to people when it's presented that way. But could the very beginning of that be true? It leaves out the box exists because there's a box maker option. It's not even mentioned, not even thought about. Now, how can we know which one's true? By studying creation. The most tested the most foundational, the most observed, the most reproduced law of all science is the first law of thermodynamics, and it says matter and energy could never create or destroy itself. Every experiment ever done by every human being confirms that this is true. In my discipline of chemical engineering, it's called the, the law of mass and energy conservation, where you'll never get something more out of a reaction than you start with. Things change, but you never get more or less than you started with. Even with particle accelerators and all of our modern physics, no scientist has ever produced even a single atom or made it disappear. You can turn it into energy, and you can actually turn energy back into matter, but you always get an equivalent amount you started with. So if we know the truth. We know the box couldn't have made itself, okay? Now keep that in mind. Every observation, we know the truth. Now, I want you to watch a little video I found of a, of a uh, professor, PhD professor of physics and cosmology, and she teaches in universities, and she put a little, like, four-minute movie about where did everything come from on YouTube, and, and it's had millions of views. L and I'm going to stop it just partway through, but listen to what she has to say. And remember what I just said about what we know about science. Matter can't make itself. Every actual scientific experiment confirms it. Here's what she has to say about where everything came from. I'm Jana, and I'm a professor of physics and astronomy. I work on where it all started. The simplest picture of the Big Bang starts with nothing. There's really nothing. There's no space, there's no time, there's no matter, there's no energy. It's nothing but the potential to exist. And out of that bursts the universe. Time starts. Okay, I'm going to stop right there. Okay? Now, why would she say in the beginning there's nothing? Because if you leave God out and you start with something, you've got to explain where did the something come from. The Big Bang starts by pretending and assuming nothing turned into everything. All the t you hear what she said all the time, all the space, all the energy, nothing existed but the potential, and then it turned into everything. 
That's the Big Bang. Now, she goes on to talk about all this time and billions of years and life developing and so on, but, but from the very get-go, don't you think if she had evidence in scientific observations, she would have shared them at that point? Don't you think? Absolutely. There is none. You see, what we need to help the people around us understand, and this is all about reaching a lost world, is that there are two beliefs going on throughout humanity. And the most prevalent one around us is that everything made itself, nothing turned into everything. The other one is that there's something outside of the box. See, the world around us refuses to think outside the box. They're stuck in the box. They won't allow a consideration of anything outside the box. God is outside the box. We also have a faith. Never deny that our belief in Christ and his resurrection and God and creation is based on a belief because no one has a time machine and we can't do an experiment to prove it. But our belief lines up with the observations of creation. The other belief denies the observations that science makes about creation. See, this is why God told us to take dominion over creation. We would learn from it, we would understand his character better, and we'd also have a rock-solid, absolute, foundational, unshakable knowledge of what the truth is, that we have a creator. So see how that helps? And it's not hard to share and comprehend. Now, one other example. Um, because I got sucked into this for years, and that was the idea that even today, stars are making themselves. Stars are remaking themselves. Um, and, and here's just kind of what you kind of see. Let me, do, let me back up. Uh, this is a kind of an evolution of stars, and a star is a huge ball of hydrogen gas. And there's so much there, packed so tightly together, that at the core of a star, the hydrogen is fusing together which releases enormous amounts of energy and turns the two hydrogen atoms into a helium atom, okay? And it releases energy. But by spewing out all that light and heat and energy, the star is slowly burning itself up. It uses itself up. You can't get nothing, something from nothing. The energy's leaving, the star is shrinking. Except it's very efficient and it would literally take millions and hundreds of millions and even for huge stars, a billion years for them to use up all their energy. But we're told the universe is like 15 billion years old. Well, that means every star should be gone. It should have all burned up like a log on a fire in that amount of time. And yet the universe is filled with stars, our own galaxy. It's like we, it's not so far away that it would take that long for light to get here. So we know those stars should mostly be all gone in the Milky Way galaxy, but they're not. So what are you going to do? if you know what's going on and you know the star ought to be long gone and yet it's not, it would indicate things aren't as old as we're told and maybe those stars didn't make themselves. The alternative is stars continually remake themselves. Clouds of gas, gravity pulls the gas closer and closer and tighter and tighter until it's the hydrogen so close together a star bursts into nuclear fusion. And that's what is in all the textbooks and all the museums and all the Cosmos special and Stephen Hawking special and National Geographic special. And, and on the um, Rocks Crowd episodes, I spend a lot longer. I'll spend a whole 45 minute episode talking about nothing but these first 10 minutes. And I show a film of those National Geographic, Carl Sagan, uh, Stephen Hawking, all of them talking about gravity pulls gas together to form new stars continuously in the universe. And I never studied it. So for a decade after I started teaching creation, I still thought stars just made themselves until someone pointed out what reality and truth really are. And by the way, here's a young man. He has been sent to astro camp where he's been trained to think. Natural processes made all the stars. The stars made the chemicals. The chemicals came alive and over billions of years turned into human beings. And it's all a fact, starting with the stars. You see that same little star graph of big gas clouds and medium-sized gas clouds and small gas clouds turning into different kind of stars. Well, here's reality. Science shows us a star could never, not even one, could ever make itself. You see, 
there's a law of science called the universal gas law that says gas always moves from high pressure out to low pressure. It always expands. If you don't contain it and have all sorts of mechanisms to force it together, it will just spread out. And outer space is a vacuum. There's no container. So gas is going to spread out in outer space according to this law of science. Now let's do an experiment. In this can is gas at high pressure. Out in this room are air molecules at much lower pressure. And the only thing separating high pressure from low pressure is a little valve. Now for a star to form, because there's gravity in this room, and gravity attracts any two particles, if a star could form, it would be like gravity packing all the air in this room, when I open this valve, down into this can, just pulling it all together, tighter and tighter and tighter. That's what we're told happens with a star. So I'm going to open the valve. You might want to hold your breath because Stephen Hawking's and Carl Sagan and National Geographic, they all tell you stars are forming all over the place. So all the air might get sucked out of this room as soon as I open this valve. I'll give you a warning. Three, two, one. Which way does it go? Out. There's never been an exception in all of human history, all experimentation, all of observation. Gas always moves from high pressure outward. Gravity is about a million times weaker than the forces of molecules bumping against themselves, pushing themselves out. If you've ever blown up a balloon, it's got, it's got a real flexible membrane that just expands outward. So you have about the same pressure inside the balloon as outside the balloon. Now you try to shove that gas inside the balloon tighter together. It forces, it's forcing your hands apart it won't allow itself to be shoved closer. It doesn't happen. We know the truth. Gas would never contract to form a star. And we've never seen a new star appear, ever. Not one time. See, we've used the Hubble Space Telescope, and now we have a 10 times more powerful space telescope platform up there. And we've taken pictures for 30 years of little bits of outer space, like the size of a grain of sand at arm's length. And we'll take that teeny little bit of the, what the telescope's seeing, we'll take a picture that lasts for like a week, because there's so little light coming in. And then they'll blow up that picture so it would cover this whole front of this whole auditorium. And you can literally count individual stars and galaxies. And then come back 10 years later and take a picture of that same spot if stars were forming, we should see some new stars. There's not a single page in a single astronomy book that ever shows, here's where there wasn't a star, and now here's a new star. Just in the Milky Way, we should see hundreds of them every year. We've never seen one. We know the truth. Now, if astronomers can be so wrong about where stars came from, and just assume it's true, if Cosmologists can be so wrong and physicists about where time, space, and matter came from and still present, and present it as if it's true. Why do we assume as human beings that these same other scientists are right about biological life or the age of the earth? They're just as wrong. So why do so many people believe it? Um, that, that's, that's what I get to. First example. Um, the man who started the scientific discipline of psychology, how does the human brain work? How does it come to the conclusion of what is true and what is false, what is right and what is wrong? How, how does it work? After his whole life of studying it, his name was Dr. William James, this is his final famous quote dealing with human beings his whole life. There is nothing too absurd to be believed if it's simply repeated often enough. Now we laugh, but that's true of us too. How do we know what we believe is actually true? I mean, honestly, how do we know? Have we been there to test every possible possibility? Have we seen everything there is to see? There's one who has, and he's told us what is true. And yet, too many Christians and too many denominations just disregard it because it doesn't agree with science. See, we've got it all backwards. Science is the one who has to guess. Honestly, science is like this. The whole universe is like this enormous puzzle, okay? 
It's like a 500 piece puzzle, except maybe it's a 50,000 piece puzzle. And, and like scientists in cosmology, they see a few pieces over here. In biology, there's some pieces over here. In geology and anthropology and microbiology and genetics, you find pieces. And furthermore, they don't have the cover on the front of the puzzle. Okay? So they're trying to put this puzzle together with 50,000 pieces and just pieces and bits here and there. And if they don't fit, they're taking scissors and cutting the puzzle pieces so they can get them to fit. The picture on the front of the box is God's Word. That's what God's Word is. It helps us to understand the history of the past. And if we leave it out, we're going to misinterpret the past. Now, here's the first example of how people can be so blind, and it's called the backwards bicycle. I want you to watch this little video, and then I'll have a few comments. Hey, it's me, Destin. Welcome back to Smarter Every Day. You've heard people say it's just like riding a bike, meaning it's really easy and you can't forget how to do it, right? Everything changed, but though, I when my friend Barney called me 25 years later. Where I work, the welders are geniuses, and they like to play jokes on the engineers. Should bring up the sound just a little bit. For me. He had built a special bicycle, and he wanted me to try to ride it. He had only changed one thing. When you turn the handlebar to the left, the wheel goes to the right. When you turn it to the right, the wheel goes to the left. I thought this would be easy, so I hopped on the bike, ready to demonstrate how quickly I could conquer this. And here he is, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Destin Salmon. First attempt riding the bicycle. All right. So, the faster I go, the better. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I couldn't do it. You can see that I'm laughing, but I'm actually really frustrated. In this moment, I had a really deep revelation. My thinking was in a rut. This bike revealed a very deep truth to me. I had the knowledge of how to operate the bike, but I did not have the understanding. Therefore, knowledge is not understanding. The algorithm that's associated with riding a bike in your brain is just that complicated. Think about it. Downwards force on the pedals, leaning your whole body, pulling and pushing the handlebars, gyroscopic precession in the wheels, every single force is part of this algorithm. And if you change any one part, it affects the entire control system. I do not make definitive statements that often, but I'm telling you right now, you cannot ride this bicycle. You might think you can, but you can't. I know this because I'm often asked to speak at universities and conferences and I take the bike with me. It's always the same. People think they're gonna try some trick or they're just gonna power through it. It doesn't work. Your brain cannot handle this. For instance, this guy. I offered him $200 just to ride this bike 10 feet across the stage. Everybody thought he could do it. No, 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 no. No, you didn't understand. You didn't understand. So, this way. <laughs> All right, I'm just like, All right, so, uh, whatever you're in, yeah. Wait, wait. No, no, you have to keep your feet on. <laughs> Once you have a rigid way of thinking in your head, sometimes you cannot change that, even if you want to. I stayed out here in this driveway and I practiced about five minutes every day. My neighbors made fun of me. I had many wrecks, but after eight months, this happened. One day I couldn't ride the bike and the next day I could. It was like I could feel some kind of pathway in my brain that was now unlocked. My son is the closest person to me genetically and he's been riding a normal bike for three years. I wanted to know how long it would take him to learn how to ride a backwards bike, so I told him if he learned how to ride a backwards bike, he could go with me to Australia and meet a real astronaut. Are you gonna give up? No. Go ahead. This is how it starts. Look at this. This is such a big deal. Get up, you got it. Did you see his brain get it? So he, in, how many weeks have we been doing this? Two weeks? In two weeks, he did something that took me eight months to do, which demonstrates that a child has more neuroplasticity, am I even saying that right, than an adult. It's clear from this experiment that children have a much more plastic brain than adults. That's why the best time to learn a language is when you're a young child. Felt like the only person on the planet who had ever unlearned how to ride a bike, and I couldn't articulate it to anyone because everybody just knew that you can't forget how to ride a bike. So I learned three things from this experiment. I learned that welders are often smarter than engineers. I learned that knowledge does not equal understanding. And I learned that truth is truth, no matter what I think about it. So be very careful how you interpret things because you're looking at the world with a bias, whether you think you are or not. I'm Destin, you're getting smarter every day. Have a good one. 
So he knew exactly what to do. He knew all he had to do was turn the handlebar in the opposite direction he was used to and lean in the opposite direction. He could not get his brain to do it. Even though he had the right knowledge, he couldn't actually do it because he'd been trained to act and think in only a certain way. It took him eight months. Only took his son two weeks. Why? Why is there such a battle over our public education system when we even do something as innocuous as try to put a sticker onto a biology book? Because if you can get someone to think in a certain way when they're young, and by the way, all of the people around us have been told in the order of 10,000 times over the first 20 or 30 years of their life that things are millions and billions of years old. Just they've just been told it. They're going to interpret and think everything in those terms. And they're going to misinterpret everything because of it. What's God say? Trust in the Lord with all thy heart. Don't lean on your own understanding because you don't even know when you're thinking wrong. See, God gave us that freedom so we'd have the choice to obey or not, to choose truth or not. But then he warns us over and over and over again throughout Scripture, don't let your heart be hardened. And it's talking about our thinking and our beliefs. Because if we do, we literally become blind. Now, it's not even necessarily a choice. A young kid doesn't choose, I'm going to grow up and disbelieve in God so I can sin. They're just trained to think in a way that leaves God out. And then it's really, really tough to reach them. Uh, So that's what's going on. God's word is the lamp unto our feet and the light unto our path. Not the latest scientific interpretation of some data. Even if it sounds really, really convincing. Now, jumping ahead to the biological sciences. Saw this slide earlier. Saw how parts can't come together. But what about the parts? I talked about how complex they are. I want you to help you understand it. The most common molecule that the cells of our body are made out of are called proteins. Now, a protein is like this long beaded chain. Okay, now this is, it's microscopic. You need an electron microscope to see it. But this represents it. It, This is long beaded chain has a bunch of different colored beads. The things that are called, the chemicals that are called the building blocks of life are called amino acids, and there's 20 different amino acids. Think of Lego blocks. There's only a a certain number of different shapes of your basic Lego blocks. There are long ones and thin ones and different thicknesses and different numbers of dots on the top. But let's say there's only 20 different Lego blocks. You can build Empire State Buildings and Tyrannosaurus Rexes and spaceships and little animals and all sorts of stuff with those 20 shapes by putting the right block in the right position. That's what God did. He builds these proteins by taking these 20 different shaped amino acids and God lines them up in exact order. And every single one has to be in the right place or it's like you've put the Lego blocks in the wrong spot and and it doesn't work. You don't get the right structure. Each one of these long chains of beads is called a protein. Now let me show you what one protein looks like. Okay, that's one protein. Now they range from about 400 beads long up to about 50,000 beads long. This one's about 4,000. And every single color has to be in the right spot. Why? Because by putting the the little beads in the right spot and each amino acid's a different shape, this whole long chain will then bend and fold and twist to form exactly the correct three-dimensional geometric shape of exactly the right size. Now that's just like the parts of this pen. Each one's a different shape, three-dimensional shape. Each one's designed to fit into another part. That bacteria has 1,000 different proteins and every one of them is a different shape. You can't even explain using all of our scientific knowledge where even one of these could ever come from because they're not random. Evolution is just random chance. They all have to be placed in exactly the right position so this whole thing will form exactly the right shape. It is stunningly obvious it could never make itself. Now I want to show you a little film of a bacteria they recently found that supposedly one of the oldest bacteria on Earth, like two billion years old. And uh, check it out. It's called the MO1 bacterium found in this 
really deep rock layer. It would have been some of the first things buried during Noah's flood, actually. It has seven purple gears, perfectly formed gears, surrounded by 21, 21 smaller, perfectly shaped and placed green gears. Now, at the back of each of the purple gears, there's a little electric motor. Okay, I'll get to the motor in a second. And by all those gears being in position, the purple gears have a little, what's called a, a cilia. It's like a little hair hanging out. They're all rotating in the same direction at the same speed. And it forms a little propeller. So it can like drive the little bacteria around so it can hunt for food. And then they can stop one of those spinning little, little fibers and reverse it in about a fourth of a turn. And they will turn as much as 20,000 rotations per minute. Now here's what's driving each one of those little gears. Where's my, okay. This is a little electric motor. It took, it took biologists probably tens of millions of dollars in 10 years to figure out what's making these little hairs spin inside of this little bacteria. It has, I think, right around 40 parts. That's what I'm remembering, 40 different proteins. So every one of these different colors is a different protein that forces it to form a perfect shape. It's got a shaft, it's got this little flagellum, cilia thing, it's got ceiling rings, it's got these little generators that generate positive and negative charges so that they can repel each other and it will be caused to spin. And if you take an electric motor driving a fan and remove any part, it's a piece of junk. It will no longer work. Every single part has to be there, exactly the right size, placed in exactly the right position. And if any of them's missing, it doesn't work. Isn't it stunning to you that a scientist can look at that and say, wow, it just made itself. And you can line 10,000 of these motors in the width of a human hair. That is awesome. The things God has done. Quick question. They're, they're, they're like spaced in that little bacteria. Behind that little gear, it's in the, it's in the wall, of the, the cell wall. It would be along the outside of the cell wall of the bacteria. Well, bacteria, there's more bacteria in our body than there are cells in our body. So any of these bacteria that have a little spinning tail have a little motor inside of it, okay? Yep, they're, they're just everywhere. Honestly, they're everywhere. God has built these little motors and all these little bacteria. Then that's just like, he wants us to know the truth. And we should be flabbergasted and stunned by his ability, intellect, and design. And instead, as sinful human beings, we look at that and say, wow, look what evolution has done. There's no evidence. It's just an assumption because we've left God out. Last example from biology. There is this critter called a leafhopper. And by the way, I give you these examples as tools to try to help other people who don't know the truth to come to the truth because God wants the truth to be known, to help get them past their blindness. You've got to show something stunning to hopefully wake people up. And this is another one. Okay, so here's this little thing that looks like a variation of a grasshopper. Um, and it turns out when it jumps, it accelerates at 400 times the acceleration of gravity. Like when I drop a ball, it accelerates. It goes faster and faster as it falls toward the floor. Um, and you can feel this as the car is going around a you know, curve. It's like it's the speed at which it's changing uh, that throws you to the side and, and you feel that acceleration. At about 10 g-forces, that's 10 times the acceleration of gravity, our blood is typically draining from our face and will tend to black out. So they test like jet pilots and astronauts in a centrifuge where they're spinning around and around faster and faster and faster um, to see if they can take this kind of force as they're leaving Earth's atmosphere. I want to show you what 10 g's looks like, 10 times the acceleration of gravity. That's what it looks like inside of the centrifuge. They're moving forward so fast, their faces are being shoved backwards, okay? And they're in danger of blacking out. Now, this little grasshopper, leaf hopper, it takes off at 400 G-forces. Now, that, just the little baby nymph, it, it, because the bigger ones are heavier, they don't move that fast, but the tiny little one that's like the size of a grain of sand, when it jumps, it has these little legs Flinging it forward, it could jump like a bullet coming out of a gun that fast, okay? It's there and then it's gone. Scientists can't figure out something. See, they know 
when it's walking along, it's like dum de dum dum dum, and the little insect brain says jump. That signal has to go down the nerves of its back, and the signal has to go to the, the, the like little protein muscles that contract its legs, the right leg and left leg, and then both legs have to shove forward. But they know how fast the nerve signal moves, and they know how fast that muscle has to contract in order to move it forward at 400 g-forces, like a bullet. And when it splits, they realize that signal isn't going to reach both legs at the same time. Just a little fraction of a nanosecond, faster or slower, one of those muscles is going to contract faster than the other. So if I go to jump and I shove with my right foot first, am I going to go in a straight line or am I going to go sideways? Sideways. So at the speed of a bullet, this insect ought to slam its head into the tree and its brains ought to go flying all over the forest. That's what ought to be happening. But it doesn't. And they're trying to figure out why. So they went and they started like dissecting and using electron microscopes. And way deep down in the middle of this insect, this is what they found. Two perfectly formed gears. So there's a gear at an angle, one connected to the left leg, the other one connected to the right leg. And as one of them starts to move, the gears make sure both move, legs move in perfect unison. Isn't that cool? It's like those gears weren't made in a machine shop. Those are a certain shaped alignment of amino acids that make a perfect three-dimensional gear shape. And then they've got to be placed at exactly that angle. Now, what's evolution say? They'll look at that and say, wow, look what evolution has built. Because it's useful. Well, it must have been made that way by chance because it was useful. But they never explain to students how could that happen. See, let me just give you an example. Suppose there was something that wasn't a gear in some pre-leafhopper insect, okay? The ancestor of the leafhopper didn't have a gear because it couldn't have just appeared. Maybe it just had a little round nut-like thing. Well, a mutation's like hitting it with a hammer. I just made a little nick. Now hit it again, hit it again, hit it again. Might start to form a little fin. Just, just hit it day after day, week after week, month after month, for millions of years. I'm just making little fins. Is that ever going to turn into a gear inside of this insect? Well, maybe. I mean, maybe. But think about it. Suppose I start to form a little fin, and you don't have it over here. It's just going to rub the other piece of tissue and ruin it, and that animal's going to go extinct. Or I might have two fins over here and only one fin over there. Or maybe they'll not be at the right angle. Or even if you have them, maybe they're not touching and they're just grinding on each other. Or maybe they're not connected to the legs, so they're just a useless, useless piece of tissue inside of that animal. Or there's not a muscle attached to the gear to pull it forward yet. Or there's no nerve to send the signal from the muscle to the brain to tell it to pull that gear forward. Or there's no instinct in the brain yet to tell it what to do with all this stuff. You see, unless everything is there, exactly the right shape, at exactly the right angle, with exactly the right number of fins, attached to the leg, attached to the muscle, with a nerve signal and an instinct, unless everything's there, it's a useless piece of junk that's going to kill that insect. Now, we know that could never happen. That's creation for all of it to be there all at once. So these biologists, they know the truth. They just refuse to accept it because they've been trained that way. Next example of how that happens. And let me show this next video. Okay, turn Only up. Only in the eye. Everything would be upside down to us. Just as in a camera, the lens of the eye forms the image upside down. The image is then inverted by the brain so that it appears right side up. Now, what would happen if a lens system were used to form the image right side up? Well, the brain would immediately invert the image so that it would be upside down. But would this condition be permanent? To answer this question, we asked Mr. Gratz, our optical expert, to design for us a pair of inverting spectacles. While the spectacles were being constructed in our shop, we faced the problem of who was going to wear the things continuously for several weeks. You'll want to meet our unlucky winner. That's right, me.
Even from the first, it was possible to walk in this topsy-turvy fashion. But it didn't take long to develop a rollicking case of seasickness. We decided that for your sake as well as ours, we'd better conduct our first test sitting down. However, just sitting down wasn't so easy. Even the simplest tasks were at first impossible. No amount of concentration or effort could overcome the compulsion to reach in the wrong direction. The inverting spectacles had to be worn every waking moment during the entire period of the experiment. Anytime the glasses were removed, the eyes were closed or fully covered. Walking to work upside down was an exhausting experience but it provided a valuable period of relearning and reorientation. It also caused quite a stir in the neighborhood. <laughs> Gradually, it became easier to get around in this upside-down world. Now, this video By a slow and painful process, the image in the brain had been erected. Now, this video is on the very first Rocks Cryout episode, and there's a longer version. But let me help you understand what's going on. His brain is getting in information. Because he's got the glasses on, everything's upside down, but his brain knows it's supposed to be right side up. Everything's 180 degrees backwards. Everything's the opposite of what I've been told to believe. But a visual image is powerful. Billions of bits of information keep coming into his brain saying, everything's upside down, but it ought to be right side up. Everything's upside down, but it ought to be right side up. And it took about two weeks. And it wasn't after one week things were at 45 degrees. And after 10 days, they're at 70 degrees. He wakes up one morning, takes off the mask, puts on the glasses, opens his eyes, and everything's now right side up. The exact opposite of what is actually reality. And now he can't not see things that way. His brain only sees things backwards because of all the information that's come into his brain telling him what is wrong is really right. Do you see that happening all around us? It's because of what people are hearing over and over and over again, leaving out God. And God tells us to cast down our imagination, cast down high things that exalt itself against the knowledge of God, bring every thought into captivity with God's word, with the obedience to Christ and what he's told us and God has told us. They're one and the same. Because if we don't, we'll become so blinded we don't even realize we're blind. That's what's going on all around us. Now, if you can help your children and your grandchildren from an early age start to understand, just because people are telling you something doesn't mean it's true. Just because science is saying something doesn't mean it's a fact in reality. It's an interpretation. Just because your teacher is sincere and educated and smart and nice, you don't have to hate her and disagree with her and argue with her them but realize they've been trained to think in a way that leaves god out so they're coming to the wrong conclusion and it's true about dating methods too they're all based on assumptions and i've got several lectures dealing with that but what about those rock layers i mean all those trillions of dead animals um, these are dead animals that used to be alive here on earth there's no denying it dinosaurs existed they're bones we dig up out of the ground some of them, they're fully articulated. You can tell what these animals looked like. But how did they get there? If you leave out Noah's flood, if you leave it out of your thinking that the whole earth was flooded by water, you are guaranteed to misinterpret the past. You're guaranteed to misinterpret how long canyons and mountains and rock layers take to form because you're leaving the truth out as you go study the data. You see, this flood would have caused trillions, everything that was alive on earth, every plant, every tree, every blade of grass, every animal was killed that wasn't on the ark. Now, seeds would have been floating around, and once the water abated and the land surfaces rose up, would have very rapidly turned into new vegetation. Millions of things in the oceans and lakes would have died, but many of them wouldn't have went extinct. They would have survived. And most dead animals and extinct animals are sea creatures. But the oceans still are filled with animals that did survive the flood. And the land animals came from the ark. Extensive rock layers would have laid down rapidly. 
all those trees and plants and grass and wheat fields, they would have been packed down and covered with more sediment and turned into coal seams, and that's exactly what we find. And in one of the Psalms, it says, and the mountains rose up and the valley sunk down and the waters returned from whence they had come. So that water got shoved from the fountains of the great deep up out of the oceans, sweeping across entire continents and devastating everything. This flood was not just some little local event for 40 days and 40 nights. It lasted an entire year. And it had enormous geological implications of how rapidly these rock layers would have formed. But if you leave it out, you're going to misinterpret the rock layers. That's what's going on. How do we know what the truth is? God has made it clear in our lifetime several ways, and this is the most stunning. A researcher in 2005 dug up a Tyrannosaurus rex, and as the bones were being pulled out, they broke, and she said they smelled like rotted garbage. Uh, and she's that really thought, well, how can that be? All of these fragile molecules that make up the cells and body parts of everything that's alive, when you die, all the mechanisms in a cell that protect these little molecules stop working, and oxygen and sunlight and and anything in the environment starts to defragment and they start flying apart. And we can measure in laboratories how long these molecules will work, last. And it's only a matter of thousands and tens of thousands of years. It's not hundreds of thousands or millions of years. They couldn't last that long. So she thought, I shouldn't smell anything. Dinosaurs were told have been in the ground for 60 million years. There should be no smell. There should be no organic molecules left. Here's a quote from her. As she took these bones back, dissolved away the minerals, the, the parts of the body of the animal that had turned into rock, dissolved all that away with a weak acid, she found blood vessels and blood cells and pieces of collagen and all sorts of organic tissue inside of this dinosaur bone. She said, I got goosebumps. It was like looking at a modern bone. I couldn't believe it. How could blood cells survive that long? Like, I hear this is a picture from her report. Here, here's a vein or a capillary with a blood cell inside. Here's a piece of collagen that's stuck to the outside of, of, of two pieces of fragment that used to be bone. Um, listen to this little interview she does, and, and then I'm going to be wrapping up. The scientific world is still reeling from the discovery of actual Tyrannosaurus rex cells and soft tissue unearthed last week at a Montana excavation site. Thank you for having me. So, is that amazing to find this kind of soft tissue in a fossil this old? And what can the soft tissue really tell us? Um, well, it is, it is it's very amazing. It's uh, utterly shocking, actually, because it flies in the face of everything that we understand about how tissues well, and cells 70 degrade. million years old. You don't expect to find soft tissue, do you? Not at all. No, it's, it was utterly shocking. So you have to sort of rewrite the book as far as fossilization goes, I, I, I assume. Well, that's, that's the exciting part for me. I've always been very intrigued by how, uh, how things change in going from a living being to part of the rock record. And um, like I said, a lot of our science doesn't allow for this. All of the chemistry and all of the molecular breakdown experiments that we've done. You know, well, okay, I'm going to stop right there. She said some of our science doesn't allow for it. She's being generous. All of our science doesn't allow for it. All of the molecular breakdown experiments, they show that this tissue can't be millions of years old. She went on to try to chemically attach iron from blood to the, to the molecules, and kids will Google this, and it'll say on Google, well, we now know how soft tissue could be preserved by iron. And yet she used anticoagulants, uh, she chemically altered the iron from the blood. She spun it down in a centrifuge. She, ad she added um, all sorts of aid reagents to make sure the iron was available. And it still was a hundred times too short of a life for these, these molecules to survive. But students will be lied to and told we now know how it happens. We don't. It's all smoke and mirrors and fantasy. The actual science shows it can't be there. And yet she still believes it's millions of years old because she's been trained. Evolution's a fact, evolution's a fact, millions of years, billions of years. And she's going to interpret everything that way, even when it flies in the face of everything we know. Now, I've got one last little video about how we can all be blind, how human beings are literally like sheep that follow other sheep. But I want to take the next 10, 15 minutes or as long as you want and just do questions. And if we have time, I'll show this last little video. But the point of what I've just done for the last 50 minutes is every area of science, God has made the truth 
absolutely crystal clear. God's Word has made the truth emphatically, understandably crystal clear. And the two really to agree with each other. And it's, it's the teaching over and over again about partial superficial observations that get people to the point where they can't see the truth even when it's put right in front of their face. And it's our job as Christians to do exactly that. Jesus said you don't put a candle under a basket. You put it on a hill. You don't hide the truth. And if the problem is people are being told a lie over and over and over and over again, we've got to get the truth in front of people over and over and over again. And I think that's a big key of what we could do to draw people into the kingdom uh, in this area of truth and knowledge. Okay, questions? Anybody? And it can deal with, I mean, I didn't even have time to get into dating methods and how they work and uh, uh, a lot of dinosaurs, where they fit in, or the Ice Age and all that stuff. But if you have questions, ask. I, I was getting my degree in theology. When I first yeah. Um, it was hard to fathom some of the things that I was being told, knowing that there was a flood. Right. And in the Wallawas is part of the Austra Austrian... Alps. Right. Right. That's a rock layer. That, 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 what I don't know your name is, but she's referring out of geology how you'll have rock layers all the way over in Europe with exactly the same layer, a completely different area across the other side of the world. Because things were happening worldwide during this flood. And then they're saying that climate change, climate change, climate change. Same thing. Over and, and over and over and over again. I was show, I taught a little geology class up at the Rosario Beach. It's an Adventist uh, school. And I showed them where the glaciers had uh, carved out the rock. And, and if you notice, all the hills here in Oregon are all shaped this way because yeah. the, the ice right. just scoured across it. Yeah. Um, but we have saber-toothed tigers, fossils here. Yep. Tropical. Hello, this yeah. recycles. And what is can I, let me put all that into a bigger picture for folks, because they're hearing what you're saying, but I'm not sure, as you understand the bigger picture, I'm not sure everybody does. So let me just take a moment. After the flood, there was, there was massive land movement during the flood, okay? The mountains of today did not exist before Noah's flood. The, the Rockies, the Himalayas, the Alps, the Andes, they didn't exist. At the top of Mount Everest, we find fossil seashells. That means those rock layers formed underwater, but when? Almost all the experts that I know of that are studying geology from a biblical, real flood perspective, they believe there had to have been massive land movements in the latest stages of the flood. We see continents today moving about as fast as our fingernail grows. So if you divide like you know, a fourth of an inch per, you know, maybe a half an inch per year um, to the gap between Europe and America, that distance divided by that rate, you come up with hundreds of millions of years that these continents have been slowly moving. But that's an assumption. It's an assumption they've always been moving that slow. The illustration I like to use is if you had two trains coming together and like next year they're an eighth of an inch closer and a whole year later they're an eighth of an inch closer, and a whole year later, they finally touch and bump. Are they going to push each other up into a big heap? No, they're either going to stop or they're just going to go in the other direction. Now, imagine you have trains coming together at 20 and 30 miles per hour, and they hit. You know what happens. It's a train wreck, and they all just get heaved up into a huge rubble pile. That's the mountains of the world. India slammed into Asia probably month five or six or seven of the flood, and it shoved all these newly laid down layers that turned into the rock layers of the earth thousands, tens of thousands of feet up into the air above ocean level. And meanwhile, as the continents are being shoved up, the ocean basins are sinking down, and as the water ran off the continents, it carved out all these river valleys all over the earth and the Grand Canyon. And meanwhile, because of all the land movement and all the volcanism, the oceans have been heated up and heated up and heated up for the whole year of the flood. The ocean water temperature drives the weather, weather patterns of the earth. So you have more evaporation after the flood. All that evaporation is going to have to come back down. 
And in the northern latitudes, it's going to cool and come down as snow. Cloud cover is going to be reflecting a lot more sunlight. And it's going to snow week after week, month after month, year after year. There may have been snowstorms that lasted for months, followed by a break, followed by more snowstorms that lasted for weeks and months that would have packed down and formed layers separated by distinct rings. So they do ice core drilling and they assume each ring is a different year. It was probably just a snowstorm. And there's not been hundreds of thousands of years. There's only been maybe a thousand years or 500 years of snow. Once the ocean cooled down and it would take that long, then the evaporation slows, the cloud cover clears, and all that ice starts to melt back. But there's huge ice dams that have formed, and that's what made the Columbia River Valley. The man that proposed this back in the 1920s proposed there was an enormous flood that created the Columbia River Valley when an ice dam broke and allowed an enormous lake to drain all the way out to the Pacific created the scab lands of uh, Washington and the Coolies in the Columbia River drainage plain. He was ridiculed and laughed at because it sounded too much like a global event, a huge flood event. Uh, he was, but he wouldn't give up. And year after year, he kept bringing more evidence and more evidence and bringing them to the conferences. And it wasn't until the 1950s when they started doing satellite pictures of the area and they realized it was undeniable that he was vindicated. Now, he wasn't even a Christian, but he dared to propose a major flood event. And that was just the aftermath. Back to global warming. When I hear about global warming, I, I just think of, I, I've got all these examples of how, well, it doesn't fit. I mean, I, I've been going down to Florida for 50 years to, in Daytona Beach and other places, and the same hotels are on the same beaches, the same distance from the ocean as they were 50 years ago. Where's the huge rise in ocean level? In, in the Bible, we had m multiple times where you'd have droughts that lasted for three and a half years or two years or drove everybody to Egypt. And you've had climate, yet a little mini ice age in the, in the 14 and 1500s. There's been all sorts of fluctuations of climate all over this globe throughout known history. Um, so it is an, ap an, an assumption that it's purely mankind's activities that's causing these climate changes or uh, variations. And we don't know if they're periodic or short-ranged. Um, so whenever I hear this issue, I say, yeah, there's been an enormous climate change event. It's called Noah's Flood, and I start to tell people about that, where the ocean levels dropped, I believe, a documented at least 200 feet. The Pacific, the Atlantic, the Arctic, the Indian Ocean, drop 200 feet. That's how much water evaporated, forming these huge glaciers. And then over the next thousand years, it all melted and went back into the oceans again. That's climate change. It, it's like what we're seeing is this little bitsy drop out of an eye, drop or drop compared to what happened 4,500 years ago during Noah's flood. Keep that in front of people instead of scaring these little kids to death that the planet's about to grind to a halt. Uh, now, not to say we shouldn't take care of God's creation. We shouldn't pollute and burn and waste and destroy. You know, there's nothing wrong with taking care of it. But to live in fear and to cause an entire generation to live in fear, you know, and to give enormous amounts of control over to governments run by wrong for, you know, concepts, it's not going to have a good ending. So, anyway, um, uh, that was my little soapbox. <laughs> yeah, okay, that's wonderful. Um, I have a question that kind of goes beyond this in a way. Uh, right now, uh, I see a lot of evolutionists saying, well, we agree that you know, life could have come into existence here. It probably rode a meteorite or a meteorite. Right. right. Let me, let, let, what, let, what do you say to those Let people? me answer that. And that's really, really popular. Life is so complex, and every experiment we've ever done always has the same result. Chemicals never come alive, so we know the truth. You've got to come up with some answer if you're going to leave God out. Two answers are very, very, very prevalent. One is that even our DNA must have come from some sort of an extraterrestrial alien that just brought it here to Earth, or it just floated through space and eventually some uh, meteorite with organic material in uh, you know, complex DNA landed here on Earth, and then things have evolved since then. My answer is it still doesn't work. 
because every step along the way from a bacteria to the next creature, you've got to add useful, functional, complex, interrelated information. And that never happens by random changes. Every mutation, every example of every known mutation destroys useful information. And occasionally it's useful. Like there are blind cave salamanders and, and they live their life in darkness. And if a creature grows in there and, and they mutate to where they lose their sight because it's not serving any function in the next generation, if the information is lost for the brain to be able to interpret visual images, it's a loss of functioning information, but now their brain is freed up so a large number of neutrons can then, they can focus on sound and touch and feel and vibrations. And that animal's gonna function better in a blind cave than a salamander that has vision will function in that blind cave. So it's a mutation that allowed it to have an advantage, but it's a loss of information. And it doesn't explain how sight could have appeared. And I like to use this example, because you'll find that in all your kids' textbooks, that blindness, it was a mutation that allowed for the an advanced abilities of things that live in caves. Suppose you're in a movie theater with 500 people, and one of those people is blind. And someone, the lights go out, and it's total darkness, and someone yells, fire! And everybody panics. Who of those 500 people is going to be able to function best and have an advantage? The blind person will. But is that blind person more highly evolved? No, he just has an advantage in a really small, specific environment. And he's lost information and function. That's the way to look at mutations, but that's not the way kids are trained to think. Okay, other questions? Back here. Back to astronomy. <clears throat> How are meteorites, uh, how are they made, and where do they come from, and uh, about them, if everything is in order? Yeah, um, in, in general, this is just a generalization, okay? Um, space is full of junk. Um, I, I mean, we don't even know. Stars do spew out things. Stars explode in supernovas, and all that stuff can collect and form into little chunks that's then going to float all over the universe in, in either gas clouds or chunks of stuff. There is a meteorite belt in our solar system, and it's between Mars and Jupiter. There's an, just an enormous amount of space between those two planets, and there are billions of little chunks of things that range anywhere from 10, 20 miles in diameter to millimeters in diameter. And they're all just kind of circling there. And there's other bits of space junk that's floating other way. There's a lot of people, and, and this, this isn't a biblical creation issue because we don't know, that believe there used to be a planet there that collided with another something else and it just blew up. And that's what's left all that rubble. Now, occasionally one of those things will, gravity will pull things different directions. It gets get kicked out of its orbit and it'll end up floating around in a different spot, and it could come crashing to Earth. Whenever we see a shooting star, and, and they're not that uncommon, I've seen several in my life, um, that's a chunk of matter, like a little rock, that has intersected with the orbit of Earth as it goes around the sun. And the, the gases in our atmosphere cause it to heat up to the point it becomes red hot and it, it emits enormous amounts of light and we'll see a flash go across the sky as it burns up. So these meteorites, um, they could have come from stars, they could have come from planets that blew up, they could be leftovers from as God was stretching out the universe and things were left over. Um, I, most of the planets have all sorts of mysteries that can't be explained. Um, you know, where'd the water come from on Earth when we don't find it anywhere else? Why is it exactly the right spot from the sun to allow exactly the right amount of heat and light for life? Why are some of the planets spinning in reverse of what they ought to be if this was just naturally formed as gas and particles went around the sun? I think all the planets of our solar system were supernaturally created. I believe stars were all supernaturally created. Life was supernaturally created. The matter and energy of the universe was supernaturally created. But for the most part, since God finished creation on day six, he has allowed the universe to operate based on the laws of science that he set up. 
Um, and there's ways to naturally explain why there's asteroids and chunks of stuff floating around um, based on things that have happened. I guess that's one of the questions we're going to have to ask God. It is. It is. Where, where did they come from for sure? to be chaos and uh, sin is chaos and sin is stuck on this world right yeah. now. Yep. Yep. There's a lot of, there's a lot of um, chaos. And during the fall, everything changed. Uh, plants, uh, you, you know, got thorns. Uh, you, you know, there was um, birth and childbirth. Uh, there, there were genetic changes. Uh, God brought death into the entire universe. And who knows, there may have been lots of chaos that happened when God changed all of creation. To, uh, that, uh, in Romans, it says all of creation. In, in the old language, it says groaneth because of mankind's sin. Um, and that's so we wouldn't live forever. Yes. Do you know of good resources for children that are creation-based related to dinosaurs? Because, you know, kids are so much into dinosaurs. Yes. Yeah, let me, let me speak to that. I say there, there, there's actually a phenomenal website called Genesis Park, and it's run by a young earth creationist, and he spent the last 20 years uh, really tracking down all of these images and carvings and references and literature in ancient history that deal with things that we call dragons that sound and look just like dinosaurs. So the original guy that came up with the name dra dinosaur was a man named uh, Sir Richard Owens. He was like a geologist, paleontologist, and he was finding these great big bones and showing that they had to be a creature way bigger than an elephant, and they didn't match the bones of any other known creature. And um, he made up the word dinosaur, which in ancient Latin meant a thunder lizard. It's a huge reptile creature that made lots of noise. Uh, but in his own writing, he would routinely refer to these same bones as dragons, and another time he would refer to them as dinosaurs. The same way we refer to dogs as dogs, other times we'll call them canines. Canines is the scientific name, dogs is the common name. Dragons the common name, dinosaur was the scientific name. So, and they hear all about dragons in the Bible, and in China, and in Egypt, and in India, and you find drawings of things that look like dinosaurs in cultures that arose since the flood. So the bones are in the ground because of the flood, but the remembrance is there because of the, they came on the ark and they've since went extinct, but people were aware of them. Now, resources, and then I'll get to your question. Um, there's three websites, and they're, 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 they're ICR stands for the Institute for Creation Research org, and CMI, Creation Ministries International dot com. Um, and you can just type in creation ministries and you come up with them. But they all have literature on dinosaurs, and some of it is really, really good, like dire dragons, and, and there's really great picture books. And they range all the way from board books for children up to great books for college students. Um, the other thing I would mention is... Um, that uh, if, if you have questions that I'm not going to answer today, go to these sites, um, Answers in Genesis, Creation Research Institute, Creation Ministries International. They all have search engines. And you can type in any of your questions, and up will come all these papers and articles and information on how it all fits biblically. So lastly, the best book I found for, for children, like, like 4 to 12-year-old children, Louis Giglio book, uh, three different books um, called the, um, Robin, are you in here? Shoot, Robin would know. Um, what's the name of Luli Gilo's book? They're devotionals. Yeah, just, they're, okay, but, but they're phenomenal for young children, because they're, they're about two pages long, you can read them, they have questions, they deal with neat things from nature, and they bring it all back to a biblical perspective. So, yep. Okay, over here. That you believe, or we believe, at least I believe, dinosaurs were not on the ark. So the dinosaurs Well, actually, no. No, I go bibl biblically, no is told to take two of every air breathing, land dwelling okay. animal on the ark. What happened to those, although we kept the elephants, and yep. how come the dinosaurs of the oceans? Well, and, and I went by too quick, okay? I'm trying to cover a lot of information too quick, so I'm going to slow down. 
all of these cultures, I mean, the Bible, you go to Job chapter 40, it describes an animal, it calls behemoth. It towers above mankind. It's a vegetarian. It eats the trees from the trees of the lotus trees near the Jordan. It drinks up the Jordan. It has bones like bars of iron. It has a tail like a cedar tree. So, now, that's not a little wimpy elephant tail or a, or a hippopotamus tail. That's a huge tree. So you have an animal towering above mankind, a vegetarian with a tail that's a huge behind it. What does that sound like? A dinosaur. Job had seen this animal, or he wouldn't have a clue what God was talking about. Job lived after the flood. You have the Chinese drawing creatures that look like dinosaurs. You have, at Arches National Park, you have a petroglyph carved into rock by the Native Americans that looks exactly like an Apatosaurus. In Australia, you have animals carved into caves that look like plesiosaurs with fins coming out where they would have had them and a long tail. All of these cultures lived after the flood of Noah. So they were seeing and drawing things that sound and look just like dinosaurs. Meanwhile, the Bible says Noah was told to take every air-breathing, land-dwelling animal on the ark. Now, Noah wasn't stupid and neither was God. God sent the animals to Noah. If the goal is to help animals survive and repopulate after the flood, he wouldn't send the biggest, oldest grandpa Apatosaurus to be on that ark. He would send young ones, juveniles, small creatures. And there's probably only about a dozen or so different kinds of dinosaurs. Think of the variety of dogs that all came from the information on two dog wolf type creatures that went on the ark. Enormous variety. So you could have lots of varieties of animals um, from a few basic kinds that had that information in their DNA. What happened to them? I suspect they didn't adapt well. They didn't survive as well. There's lots of animals that went extinct. Just because someone's extinct and when they're no longer around, doesn't mean it wasn't on the ark. Dodo birds are extinct. Well, they must have been on the ark. Um, I think that's true of dinosaurs. And the other thing, in general, throughout time, mankind has always hunted and destroyed the things that are biggest and most dangerous to them. I mean, we've almost drove the elephants to extinction. We've almost driven lions and tigers to extinction. Um, I think there was massive changes in our environment during that thousand year period, I mean, all the woolly mammoths went extinct. And those were around after the flood, during the Ice Age. The Ice Age was after the flood. But when the Ice Age ended, they didn't adapt well and they went extinct. So I suspect the same thing's true of the dinosaurs. As I said, the ones in the bones are in the ground because of the flood, but all these remembrances are from cultures that were around after the flood. And it all fits biblically but it doesn't fit evolutionary-wise. None of it should be there if evolution's true. And there shouldn't be soft tissue inside of these bones. And by the way, we found soft tissue all the way back to fossils, now that we've started looking for it, that are supposedly 500 million years old. We still find undecayed proteins inside of these fossils. The evidence is overwhelming that none of this stuff is as old as we're told. Okay, we've went 20 minutes over. Can I wrap up with one last little video that I think you'll really, really like? It's only three minutes long. This is the third example I love to show, and I show this to all the kids in every single school assembly I go to, because I want them to understand that just because they're hearing something, even if it's from experts, doesn't mean it's true. It just means it's people have been trained to repeat it and think in these terms. So this is a little film, um, called Mind Games, and it just just absolutely grabbed me when I saw this little episode um, on, on this game about how people think. So watch this last little video. It's called Peer Pressure. And here she is. Turn right the volume up on this one. 12 o'clock appointment. Hi, how are you doing? <laughs> this woman thinks she's here for a free eye exam. Have you been here before? No, it's my first time. What she doesn't know is that everyone else in this room is working for us. They'll be with you in just a couple minutes. Today, we're running an experiment on social conformity, and the test starts now. Did you hear that? These people sure did. They hear a beep, they stand up. 
It doesn't take long for our test subject to notice a pattern. Beep means stand up, but why? And if you were in her shoes, what would you do the next time the tone sounds? To answer that question, we set up a hidden camera experiment to see if this woman would stand up at the sound of this tone, simply because everyone else is. You might be thinking you'd never go along with this, or would you? After just three beeps, and without knowing why she's doing it, this woman is now conforming perfectly to the groove. But what happens if we take the group away? Elaine, please. Okay, now she's alone, the crowd is gone, and nobody is watching her, except our hidden cameras. What do you think she'll do? She's now conforming to the rules of the group without them even being there. Now, watch what happens when we introduce another outsider who doesn't know the rules. Have a seat and they'll be out in just a couple minutes. Great, thanks. thanks so much. So I thought I was supposed to. Think she'll teach the new guy what to do? We kept the cameras rolling as more unsuspecting patients arrived. And slowly but surely, what began as a random rule for this woman has now become the social norm for everyone in this waiting room. Why even this rebel, who wasn't standing for any of this nonsense, eventually joined the ranks. And the only thing more shocking than seeing how easily conformity affects the way you act is that similar forces are subconsciously shaping the way you think. Similar forces shape the way we think. And I tell students, do you believe what you believe because it's true or just because you've been told it? Do you really absolutely know? And how about your teachers? Do they believe what they believe because it's true or because it's how they're trained to think? Look for truth. Look for truth. And then God tells us, do not be conformed to this world. And it's not talking about our actions. It says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind, because our mind drives our actions. And then you will know what the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Who wouldn't want to know the will of God? The way the world is trained to think is to leave God out. That's the way they're trained to think. God says, don't be trained that way. Don't allow yourself to be trained that way. Now, I want to end just by saying equip yourself to share God's wisdom. Let me back up. There's four different devotionals I've written. Every day of the year is a different topic on creation. And, and they just are great conversation writers. They're great gifts to kids and grandkids and great-grandkids. The, the, every time I'm republishing a book, I... Whoop, let me back up. I don't know why it's jumping forward. The last two devotional has little QR codes, about two per month, where you can watch little videos. She'll read about some really cool animal, and then you can watch a video of it, uh, what it does and why it does it. Four times a year, I come out with a um, newsletter. Absolutely free. It gets mailed out. Um, I'm going to have a teenage book coming out, hopefully by the end of the year. It keeps, it keeps track of what's new, little creation information. 
And also as I go on international trips, I think they accomplish so much because people are praying. And it lets you know when I'm going to Jamaica or Fiji or our next trip is the Cook Islands and I'm speaking in public schools about connecting the Bible to everything else they're learning. And it, it's changing lives and nations. And lastly, this curriculum, there, there, I don't think there's anything else like it because it's not scripted. I'm speaking from 40 years of teaching experience and I'm on location and it's got all sorts of neat, neat video, nature footage and so on. Um, the sound is down. Had this is an example of what's inside of these videos. Go ahead. Distinctions in this creation is a very distortion of what God's word says. I often hear people say, well, it really doesn't matter when God created, as long as I acknowledge that God is creator. God tells us that creation is not just good, but very good. There is method after method after method after method of determining how old are things, and time after time, they show a recent creation. The central emphasis of everything is life began on Earth 4.5 billion years ago. Starting with bacteria. That is the foundation of the whole philosophy of evolution and naturalism. We've got to go around an established system of training people to think in only one possible way. Millions and billions of years, evolution is a fact, and show them the beauty and reality of the evidence that supports a true biblical creation model of why we exist. So I just want to show you that to give you a feel for the quality of these videos. Now, I 100% respect that a Sabbath is not made for selling stuff, but I'm typically only in a church on a Saturday or Sunday and then I'm gone. So all of those resources, if you guys just take what you want, we'll write down what the cost is and we'll send you a bill. Um, but now's the time to get them, and, and I price everything, these beautiful hardcover color books, and these, all 21 videos that are in that series for $35. They run about 45 minutes each. The books are three for 25 or seven, 10 items for 70. Um, to give away, to change people's thinking, to equip yourself to defend God's word, and um, just put it to use. That's my encouragement. We answered a few questions. Those resources answer hundreds and hundreds of questions. So I hope you will do that. And thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you.